I'm Keith McCullough, and this is where we go through six analysts in 60 minutes, and we're going to have them pitching a long or a short idea, and I'll give you some color, uh, things like risk, uh, mathematical color being uh, things like risk ranges or factor exposures or something uh, related to the quad embedded therein, so lots to talk about. Uh, they have to stay on time here, so Felix is very uh, punctual and uh. succinct and taller than me. Only barely. <laughs> you got a Chinese and a Canadian guy here, so we're both, you know, we sit beside each other, we do a lot of good work together, and it's absolutely good to have you here in person. No, absolutely, I'm happy to be here. Uh, no robe today, uh, <laughs> it's way too hot outside, uh, but I should wear it. It's been a nice surge in China stocks the past two months, but Keith, I do worry about some names heading to earnings season and Q3 guidance. One of them is Dada. You know, I pitched this short to clients last week. Ticker is DADA. Some general information on Dada, if we could go to one of the slides. You know, Dada is a large on-demand retail and delivery company in China. Uh, Dada has basically two platforms. One is Dada Now and the other is JDDJ. Uh, you know, Dada is in charge of instant delivery on the next slide. Basically, within a three kilometer radius, instant delivery these days in China generally means 30 minutes or less. Um, you know, most of Dada Now's goods are non-food products. The platform also helps with last mile delivery services. The other bigger player, uh, <coughs> excuse me, on the next slide is JDDJ. So this is Dada's on-demand retail platform. It basically provides retailers with an O2O option, uh, offer services like picking and SaaS solutions. There's multiple ways to access uh, JDDJ. DJ, but the biggest entry point is still through uh, JD's own app. Um, JD DJ's platform also helps with order volume and density for Dada now. Okay, if you guys follow my picks on the next slide, you know Dada was actually my number three survivor long last year uh, because I was optimistic about their potential going into food delivery and maybe you know by themselves and but that's but but definitely their partnership with Doing. Um, you know fast forward to today I'm flipping from long to short because the hurdles are growing for Dada particularly with no large ramp from Doing. Who is Doing? You guys should know by now Doing is China's TikTok which is owned by ByteDance okay and is in serious contention to take over many ecosystems in China. So without a large doing ramp, I think Dada could miss growth expectations, which is why I'm shorting Dada. Uh, but let's talk about doing first, because this is a big part of my short thesis on why I'm shorting Dada. Uh, so doing has been trying out food delivery for six months, right? And they had big ambitions despite limiting services to a few big cities. However, the platform scrapped their 100 billion RMB yearly target for food, food delivery this year. In fact, they may only achieve about 3 to 5 billion RMB. Uh, that's only a fraction of their year target. And now Doing has been touting what, what they call group buying food packages. These have higher AOV, which really helps with their delivery costs. Part of which goes to you know. Part of which goes to Dada. The problem here is the cautious consumer in China, which means they're not in love with high price packages, food or not. Um, in addition, there are also many challenges when it comes to food delivery. Timeliness is one aspect. So is scheduling. Uh, furthermore, you know, Douyin is asking local life providers, local life service providers to self-deliver. So that will take away future business from Dada. Meanwhile, uh, if you follow this space closely, there's been a big fight that's been going on with Meituan and Douyin to Meituan is, is pretty much the food delivery and the local life service leader. Their fight's been intensifying, particularly on the commission side. Uh, you know, I worry about this because if, if, if Meituan is being more competitive here, particularly if they're really cutting commission rates, um, you know, that could pressure Doing. Um, I'm generally skeptical of Meituan's ability to protect their moat against Doing, but they're also not pulling any punches. So 
on the next slide, you know, this, why do I talk about doing so much? Because, again, this is a big part of my long thesis last year. Now it's going to be a big part of my short thesis right now. They're expanding their food delivery network. That's generally positive, right, if you want to own data. But the problem is w when they're doing it, which is at a time where you have many challenges, particularly with the top tier cities. Food delivery also is not a top priority for doing. You know, the platform recently upgraded their wine tourism business and so forth. So I just want to rate raise that. But for doing now, on the next slide, let's now talk about outside of doing. So for Dada, you know, they're a leader in supermarket O2O. That means Dada's core clients are the supermarket retailers, and they're suffering. Uh, check out the red line here. It's, it's not doing well. On the next slide, you know, they've, they've done a good job catering to the top 100 supermarkets, but it's at a point where I see it's really harder to further penetrate. On the next slide, Dada last year. Why did I like Dada last year? Another part was they benefited from COVID-19 um, because of the panic buying resulting in empty supermarkets. P if people can't go to the offline supermarkets, they have to order Dada to bring fruits and vegetables back home. Uh, this year, there are no more COVID-19 concerns in China. I was just there in China. Nobody cares about COVID. <laughs> La uh, next slide, you know, I also mentioned the tough times community group buying had to go to last year. This year, they're actually doing better. So, you know, a tailwind for Dada becomes a headwind for Dada. Um, quickly here, on the next slide, other concerns. I talked about, you know, the Tepe 618 shopping festival. The panic buying comps again, and then competition. SF Express, Erlama, they're both pressuring data, as I know here. Also, the record breaking temperature. But generally speaking, you know, I think this name, since we're out of time, could miss expectations of going to earnings. This is, uh, this is what I like. Now, Felix, this has one, China um, is in quad four for this coming quarter that we're going into. Uh, two, it has data itself has the factor exposures. Like, you want to be short. Uh, the consumer, you want to be short small cap, you want to be short uh, things that are already bearish trade and trend. So that, all that's happening. Uh, trend for this stock is up north of $7 a share. So um, risk range is $5.18 to $6.12. So on the way up towards six twelve, you know, I'd be reloading on the short side on that. What's interesting uh, is that there's only 1% short interest. So th mm. that's very low. I mean, that's especially for a Chinese stock that has been getting pounded, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. Do, do clients push back on it? Um, Institutional I, clients. Yeah, I, I think, <laughs> a, I mean, a little bit because it's related to JD. So they were saying, yeah, how can you be long data if you like JD, since they're part of the same ecosystem. But I think it's kind of different in terms of the exposure. Um, I, I generally think, you know, I, actually, I didn't even check the short interest on this name, 1%. That's that seems too low. Yeah, yeah too I don't low. know if that's <laughs> that's right, but I, uh, could be a typo from Bloomberg. But I I generally think you know this is a volatile company, volatile stock. But I you know just like some of the other names, I don't like going to earnings. They're not in the right spot this year. Last year they were in the right spot because yep. of what happened with all the panic buying. Well, some of the best shorts that we have are the ones where the analyst, analyst flips from bullish to bearish. So thank you for that. We got to keep it going here. Uh, thank you, Felix. Tom Tobin, on the Zoom. There's a couple of things to say here about um, Progeny, which is there's a few short reports out there. There's, there's accounting issues that, that people have flagged, that people have flagged also the TAM, the size of the TAM, the clinical problems, that these things that the companies are laying claim to and some of the management's history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think all that's fine. It's not some of it I agree with. It's not really core to our thesis, essentially, other than to say that when things slow, these kinds of accounting issues tend to tend to bubble up to the top. And I think that's the case uh, here. So on slide 19, you know, pandemic was really, really favorable. Uh, you had sort of a, a confluence of things, including an incredibly tight labor market, which, you know, in increased benefit spending, uh, you know, towards something like Progeny's fertility benefit. It's also it became very much uh, emblematic of uh, diversity, uh, equality and inclusion type, um, you know, efforts on, on the corporate side. Uh, you know where you're where you're you're both signaling to your your current employees but also trying to attract and retain uh employees part of that is you know the very hot demand we had particularly amongst white collar tech um uh 
uh, you know, ar around the post-pandemic recovery, which was just, it got crazy extreme. Uh, if you go to slide 22, uh, the other point to make here is that Progeny is a good uh, quad four factor short. Um, this is based on all this quad factor analysis we've done where we look at, you know, a handful of factors that are important in quad four. How does Progeny stack up against those factors? That what's the probability of next week being up, you know, a good quarter, a good week or a down week. And that's what you're seeing here. And it's at the lower bound uh, of, of quality. It's been rallying lately, but uh, I think that's that's most of the reason why I'm, I'm pitching it here today is because none of our thesis has really changed. Um, on slide uh, 24, um, this just sort of starts out the data piece of what we're looking at. So again, fertility benefits, they get paid when people go to the uh, fertility specials, uh, their employers has, has created this benefit for them. Um, so we looked at, okay, well, where are all these uh, fertility specialists? We looked at Progeny's uh, menu of, of docs that they have online. They're all basically reproductive endocrinologists. They have a very specific um, MP, you know, basically taxonomy code, which is a key that we can search uh, through a bunch of other databases, including a claim database, which you can see on the next slide, on slide 20, uh, 25. Uh, and you can see you know, you essentially have, uh, you know, these docs that are seeing uh, payments, patients for female infertility, which isn't all that surprising. But what it allows us to do, if you skip to slide 27, uh, is to track, well, how many how many patients are actually going to reproductive endocrinologists, which is what this is. This is a, you know, based on millions of claims, we, we've got the access to this database. But essentially what you can see is the COVID spiked it down. Nobody went to the doctor at all. Uh, and you had the sort of this postcode recovery and in, in fertility uh, seeking behavior. And then in, in the 2022, 2023 period, we're slowing and it's it's now trending down year over year. I think that's important because on the next slide uh, that lines up with utilization. So somebody who's a, a, a member, they go to the doc, uh, they buy their drugs through progeny. Uh, progeny gets paid essentially from the provider uh, from the from the company that's sponsoring the um, the benefit. Uh, but what we've been seeing here, and again, this maybe this is something about the accounting, maybe this is something else, but th this was really tight up until about Q1. Uh, what we're thinking is that utilization is going to be down alongside general fertility benefit, uh, fertility seeking behavior. But that so far hasn't been the case. That may be partly uh, that you have the benefit versus not. But uh, the bottom line, we think that the slowing economy is going to slow this key KPI. On the employment side, uh, you know, who are the members? Where do they come from? The company claims there's about 75 million potential. Uh, you know, I think it's much, much smaller. You have to really consider who gets this benefit is going to be uh, high paid uh, in, in a, in a well-compensated industry. There's not a lot of that uh, nationally. And we, and we sort of done a lot of work in anecdotal, uh, collected anecdotal data. But we, all we did here on, on slide, uh, I think this is 29, uh, with the pie chart and the client, yeah, it's just, we did went through and looked at their nameplates and then and then translated that over to BLS and, and BEA data. Um, twenty percent, they claim it's, it lines up perfectly what they say, which is oh, only twenty percent of our workers come from tech. Yes, that's true, but look, if you look at the next slide, tech employment is highly levered at least in in the prior COVID period to VC. So VC, you know, that's kind of uh, you know a symptom, right? Like a, of how tight the labor market, how liquid the markets were. And it flowed through, uh, it flowed through this labor piece, and obviously VC is slowing on the next slide. Um, and what the consequences of that are on the next slide is how this flowed through employment and employment benefits, which, you know, employment for for the information that that NAICS code of 51, 400 percent above baseline during during the peak peak peak, uh, that led to job openings and wage inflation. So guess what? It's tight, uh, and that leads to on the next slide, uh, employment cost index for benefits. Um, you know, extremes there match extremes in 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 the uh, job openings, um, and then the health insurance as a part of that benefits package really drove the bulk of it. And the reason that matters, if you look on the next slide, that's really the membership at Progeny, right? So if we if we just track all this, and the the ECI number is going to come out, I think next week on the update uh, on the data for the providers. Um, you know, the providers are pretty well penetrated. You know, we looked at their list versus everybody that's in the in the the, the larger databases. And they basically got everybody they need. So there's not a lot of expansion left there. And then on the employer side, on, on the next slide, we've done this cut, taking a couple of different cuts in this, but like how many people work at highly compensated uh, large companies, which is the core market. I think it's around 12 million. That compares to about uh, 5.4 million that they've got. Damn it. 
that they claim. And then on the last slide, um, you know, the high profile short interest stuff, if I'm just tracking their, uh, their DSOs on the, on the, on the previous slide, actually, uh, DSO is at 130, kind of like, uh, that's not good. <laughs> so, uh, and if I'm right, it's going to be a $20 stock. That's it. Yeah. The, um, this stock's very interesting, uh, on a lot of levels. Uh, have you seen, by the way, how, how uh, first of all, it's the, the things that I don't like about the short is that it's in uh, the healthcare sector, which is a factor exposure that we're long. The, the good news is we have plenty of long ideas on the other side of that. Uh, I do like that the short interest has risen in this case, and I do like that it's a smaller cap stock. Um, but the, uh, I guess the CEO, Peter uh, Inversky, in, in Nevsky, um sells stock like it's his job. I mean, I, I don't know yeah. if you saw that. Uh, what's the deal with him? Uh, you know, the, the, you know. Again, if if you read the the, the short reports are, are are available, Spruce Point Capital and Leventhal. I mean, they're really really nicely written. I didn't I didn't really want to retread a lot of that, but they there's some commentary about their history, WebMD, and some other um, you know company prior histories that were you know less than savory and, and sort of critical of that. And and again, yeah, you're right. Like that that idea that we're uh, selling stock as it's if it's their job, you know, that that would be <laughs> sort of consistent with the DSOs and you know, the accounting change that they made that essentially, you know, it's paper profits, right? Like the cash flow is not actually resulting and, and they're making some, they've, they've, they've given themselves very, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, essentially discretion, let's call it, uh, in terms of reporting costs. And there's a high likelihood that they're on the hook for for people not paying their bills. Um, so that's that's just another another item to think about again. I think all this kind of stuff is great to know about, but it only really matters when when the tide's going out, uh, because obviously, you know, stock was a huge stock in the peak, peak, peak time, and now it's like, okay, well, what happens next? And and I think fertility benefits were really easy to add; they really benefited, and there's competition and a lot slower growth uh, for for 2024. Good. All right. Uh, just to give you the levels, trend is 42.12, risk range is 38 and a quarter to. Uh, 41, the figure, 40, it's actually 40 spot 99. So uh, approaching the top end of the range, just inside of the trend, those are typically good setups, especially if you have a catalyst uh, being the pending quarter. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. Uh, thank you, Tom, and welcoming in person, Jeremy McLean. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, McGough's gonna have FOMO. <laughs> he, de he definitely is. <laughs> the last time I was on here, I pitched Revolve. Oh. Which, uh, which went down 50% in a, a few months. So hopefully getting another one here on the short side. Uh, best idea short, Wayfair Oof, is the company. There we go. Um, we got three shorts in a row here, guys. Okay. The shorts, com <laughs> the shorts coming, yeah. So Wayfair, uh, what is Wayfair? I think most people know, right? Online uh, home furnishings platform. The one thing I say it's unique about it is it doesn't really own inventory. It only owns it when it's in transit. It's really like a curator connecting the buyers with the, the suppliers. Um, so, you know, the crux of the short call here, if we turn to the, the next slide, slide three, uh, or my, my third slide at least, um, the, the, the consensus ex expectations here are for an instant revenue acceleration, right? So they're going to report 2Q next week, and the expectation is that they're going to ramp rapidly, rapidly in terms of both a one and two year trend. And, you know, we think that's a problem for a couple of reasons. One, tougher compares, we think we're going to see more likely slowing. Uh, and two, right, we have these set spending headwinds around student loan payments coming back, uh, higher FICA income tax limits um, year over year that are going to be pressuring the core consumer in terms of how much they have to spend. So when we look at then the Google Trends on the next slide, we actually see that things look to be rolling over in recent weeks as we're still in sort of the middle of that, you know, difficult comparison setup. Uh, if you look at that ramp in the summer of last year, right, we're kind of midway through that ramp in terms of where we are from a comparison perspective. So still have tougher near-term compares as well as like the full back half compares. Uh, and we're seeing what looks like interest slowing for, uh, here on Google. Now, you know, not only is the consensus expecting right this revenue rapid acceleration, but if we turn to the next slide, if we look at the long-term trend here in margins, they expect margins to also go positive and stay positive here. Uh, 2023 into 2024. So this company only made money during the pandemic, and we would say that was an opportunistic pricing environment. You had high demand, actually right after the company had been cutting headcount because they were having business problems in late 2019 into early 2020. Uh, so all this excess demand at high prices with low customer acquisition costs, uh, that's the reason they were able to put up profits in 2020 and 21. 
Uh, we don't think they're going to be able to get to this profitability here near term. But you know, the, one of the big things is like you can have one or the other. Right? You can you could cut costs a ton, sacrifice revenue, and maybe get your margins to break even. You know, on a, their adjusted EBITDA, but you can't then have your top line reaccelerate at the same time. So one or the other: spend for the revenue, or cut costs and sacrifice the the top line. Um, so one of the reasons we don't think they can get to profitability is on the next slide here, the customer acquisition costs. This has been going parabolic. So after that environment in 2020 where customer ca acquisition costs went down, right, you were able to get customers very easily. Now you have the opposite happening. They're hard to, hard to come by, a lot more competitors going after them, uh, and the cost has gone up significantly. So we talk about with Wayfair, are you really acquiring customers or are you acquiring transactions? Because right? this is something you don't shop at every day or week. Uh, unless you're like an interior designer or something like that. You're, you're going once every year or two, and each time that customer is going to shop that category, Wayfair needs to reacquire them. So they're not really acquiring customers or acquiring transactions, and that's you know, costly every time you need to do it, hence the rising customer acquisition costs there. And then if we look at you know, the company's expected to do adjusted EBITDA positive here in 2Q, um, which, you know, it's adjusted EBITDA, so hopefully they can hit that number because they can theoretically take out whatever they want from it. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that they always add back, right, is stock-based comp. And we've taken a comparison here, so Wayfair against Etsy. Etsy's another one that uses a lot of stock-based comp. Uh, and then a bunch of other similar market cap, uh, you know, retail names. And you can see that they pay very low relative to, you know, the competitive set in terms of salaries for their employees. So what they end up doing then is making that up in stock-based comp, mm. uh, and then you adjust that all out. So even on like uh, an apples to apples versus the industry, their adjusted EBITDA is not the same as adjusted EBITDA because you know, they're, they're overpaying on uh, stock-based comp and underpaying on salaries that really should be part of your actual cost and not adjusted out. Uh, and obviously, there's a danger to using that strategy when your stock is under pressure as it has been over the last two years, right? We originally I mean, it's the best idea short when it was at 270. We've since covered it in the 30s and put it back on here when it crossed into the 60 range. Um, so very big, very big problem here, I think, for, for Wayfair's setup there in terms of how they do the compensation. Now, what does that also do, right? If we look at slide eight, uh, the next slide there, um, we have the percentage of both revenue and the, the market cap, expressed as a percentage of market cap that equity comp is, right? So you now have that going to uh, six percent of revenue, and uh, this year, if we use the current market cap, it's it's trending towards nine percent, right? So almost seven hundred million dollars in stock-based comp for a company, right? That doesn't doesn't make money. Um, that that's being adjusted out of their negative adjusted EBITDA margins. So uh, you have a lot of dilution risk. If you look at that dilution trend in slide, uh, the next slide here, dilute shares, right? They've gone up from you know low eighties. They're around one ten. That's actually not including the converts because you don't include uh, converts when your your EPS is negative. So that, like theoretically, it's it's even higher on a total diluted basis. Uh, and then at this on the right side, you have what's been going on with the debt, right? Talked about convertible debt that they're doing. They just did a, a six hundred ninety million dollar convert a, a couple months ago. <laughs> uh, they put a cap call at seventy three twenty eight. So like no dilution till seventy three bucks. But the stock right, was at seventy two a couple days ago, I think, uh, and since going down. But uh, you know that's not the setup you want to see if you're an equity holder with dilution going up and not making money and debt uh, rising at the same time. So bad setup for equity holders. Next point, management departures. So we've seen a bunch of top managers have been here since you know company came public leave over the last couple of years. Uh, you had your chief product marketing officer, the big one, I think in the middle there, the CFO that left in May. This was the, the sort of adult in the room that I think a lot of investors trusted in terms of managing the, the financials. Um, and then when one just announced uh, a couple days ago in the CMO leaving. Uh, on valuation, uh, this company has really not made money historically, uh, so it's hard to say what's the right valuation metric to use. I've done like a theoretical situation where if we cut out certain parts of the business, uh, right, closing international, that's very profit uh, pressuring. Um, maybe they get to 10% market share. You could theoretically build to something of like you know 20, 30, 40 bucks in, in value. Um, but again, that's that's assuming they they give up on TAM and change the investment case significantly. So um, one we think has easily 50% downside from here. Uh, short Wayfair. This, this is a 
been an amazing call. When, when did you guys first go bearish on this? It was like uh, a couple of different instances, but the big time we went was uh, fall of 2020, and the stock was right around two two hundred seventy dollars. Yeah, so, so this is the bear market that people don't want to see come back, right? You go from that price to debating whether or not this thing's worth sixty eight bucks or you know, forty bucks. But um, what's interesting is that the 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 CFO left. And the new one that they brought in, she sold. She immediately sells like a million dollars worth of stock. I mean, these these people also sell stock like it's their job. I guess it's because they're getting these it, options. Because it, it is their job, right? Like <laughs> they're, they're not they're not getting paid appropriately in salaries, right? So they all have instant like the second invest, they all sell them. Like uh, it's that's, so that's, bad. That's the I mean, cadence, so. This is the problem with Wall Street. Obviously, I mean, you get we talk about it all the time. It's one of Jay Van Skyver's you know go to lines, which is Wall Street's in the business of selling stock. I mean, if you're dumb enough to, to buy some of this stuff uh, and a lot higher, uh, that is what it is. Um, you know, I'd say some of the risks are, you know, obviously you got 32% short interest. You know, some of these basket squeeze days, this thing's definitely in the basket. Most people that are long Amazon have it paired. You know, now they got both stocks are actually going down today. But, um, you know, just things to think about. But that said, they tend to resolve themselves on D-Day. And I guess they report August 3rd. Yeah, they report next week and then they're going to have an analyst day the week after that. So. They're going to be working hard to steer the message for people. They've done that a couple times this year, and both uh, both those times it hasn't really worked. They were out after the, the, I think it was the first quarter print, or sorry, in advance of the first quarter print, telling everyone that they're going to get to this break-even number in 2Q. Um, stock right ripped in, in that January, February time period, and then you know, they, they print the number. Business was not as good as people thought, and it, it corrected 50% yeah, rapidly. You, you think their business is bad now? Wait till you know the consumer slows again and again and again for the next two quarters, uh, according to us. But I mean, just to give you levels, uh, and this is why it gets tough. I mean, trend for this is 68.40. The stock's just inside of that. So if they can squeeze it above trend, for somebody like me, I'd, I'd cover on that in the short term and then wait and watch for my range. Uh, risk range though is really wide, 64.10 to 72.75, but again, the top end of the range is above trend. So this is where the bears are you know, uh, uh, pooping their proverbial pants, so to speak. Uh, or the real people come in and they make the pitch and they make the call. So that's, uh, uh, that's why we're gonna thank you for that. All right. All right. Uh, that's that, Josh Steiner. Not easy to pitch shorts. I mean, uh, yeah, we, but we just pitched three in a row. Are you gonna give me another one? So yeah, we're going to go with uh, Discover Financial, uh, which is basically just you know straight down the middle of the lane here. Um, unsecured revolving consumer lender, that's their primary business. Yeah, you know, the problem is really, uh, well, we'll get into it. Um, we'll start here on uh, slide 55 with a couple of uh, macro theme slides, and then we'll get into uh, Discover specifically. So basically what's going on is you're seeing you know rising levels of uh, financial stress among really all cohorts, but here we're profiling uh, the millennial generation and Gen Z, uh, roughly 70% of them, um, up from you know a number quite below that, uh, not too long ago, are reporting you know living paycheck to paycheck, and very high percentages uh, indicating that they are uh, somewhat or very financially dependent still on their parents. If you go to the next slide. Um, and we look at the distribution of savings uh, across different income cohorts, what we find is that uh, both the, the bottom income uh, quintile and the second from bottom income quintile are both in a worse position from a, uh, a real savings uh, standpoint than they were before the pandemic started. So uh, the effects of uh, ongoing inflation have uh, drawn those savings down uh, well below where they were going into the pandemic. And in fact, if you look at the bottom 60% of earners in the country, uh, in the aggregate, they are now in a worse off position uh, than they were before the start of the pandemic. But it gets worse. If you go to the next slide and we look at um, what's coming around the bend here in just about two short months, uh, we're going to see this you know, much talked about, but uh, nevertheless, incredibly significant resumption in student loan payments. Uh, so we went back and looked historically at what would have the what would the effect have been on real PCE or personal consumption expenditure growth uh, if people instead of not making their student loan payments uh, had been making them over the, the past year. And what we found is uh, about 65 to 70 percent of the growth that we saw would not have been there. Uh, that's that's how large the effect is going to be uh, starting in two months time. So obviously this is going to put significant incremental strain at the individual level. 
Um, next slide here, you know, as a reminder, we've really seen this sort of K-shaped recovery dynamic uh, in the wake of the pandemic. Basically those, if you will, in the top half of the K from an income or, or asset standpoint have generally been uh, doing better. Those in the bottom half or really the bottom 60, 70% have been getting increasingly squeezed uh, under the weight of inflation. So now let's take a look at uh, Discover's trends. So on slide 59, uh, we're seeing a pretty significant slowdown in card sales volume. So basically volume uh, running over Discover cards. And actually uh, that came down 700 basis points uh, in year over year rate of change terms just in the last quarter. So in Q1 of this year, it was up 9.2% year over year. And in Q2 of this year, it was up 2.5% year over year. Uh, next slide, slide 60. You know, each of these different big credit card companies uh, have different exposures to what are called subprime consumers. And in the credit card world, uh, somebody with a credit score below 660 is uh, considered subprime. So Discover, roughly one out of five of Discover's uh, borrowers um, is subprime. So, you know, that's kind of a middle of the road exposure. Uh, Capital One is higher. They're up around uh, one out of three. American Express is uh, a bit lower, uh, but these guys are sort of right in the uh, right in the center line there, right in the crosshairs. Uh, so what's been happening with their credit quality? If we go to the next slide, uh, there's a lot of seasonality in, in credit quality, and that's why you see this line sort of rise and fall uh, each year and not necessarily go, you know, in these smooth trends. Um, but even not, you know, even with that in mind. Uh, Discover has reached a level of delinquency, 30 plus day delinquency on its card book that's now uh, above really anything we've seen since the financial crisis. And that is certainly notable given the fact that uh, unemployment is still in the you know, mid threes. So obviously spending growth slowing, um, delinquency trends rising. Uh, next slide, 62. If we look at uh, charge off rates, charge offs basically follow delinquencies on a lag. Uh, those are now getting up to pre-pandemic levels as well. Um, next slide, you know, a few words of wisdom from uh, one of the sort of gray beards in the industry, Rich Fairbank, the CEO of Capital One, who really sort of invented the modern uh, credit card business. You know, he basically makes two observations. And, and again, these are born out of, you know, having been in this game now for, you know, 30, uh, 30 plus years. He basically says, you know, Often the standard way people think about things from a credit standpoint is they focus on the level of unemployment. Uh, and, and what they find is that instead of doing that, uh, what really matters is, is the rate of change. Uh, that's what matters the most. So he sort of explains that a bit. <clears throat> and then he talks about another effect, which doesn't generally get that much airtime. And that is that, um, you know, if you sort of go back and you look over his 30 years of a journey in the business, uh, what they found is that periods of abnormally good credit are followed by periods of uh, worse credit and vice versa. And the credit performance over the last three years has been unprecedentedly good. Um, next slide, just real quickly, um, you know, loan fee income for Discover has exploded. That's a euphemism for late fees. Uh, they're up 31% year over year. That's not good because on the next slide, uh, the CFPB is thinking about uh, massively reducing late fee uh, charges that are allowed. So right now, uh, the average late fee is around $41. Uh, the CFPB is thinking about lowering that to $8. Uh, and this is about 15% of Discover's pre-tax income. So that would be a big hit if that, in fact, rolls out as it's expected to uh, later this year. Real quickly on the next slide. Discover has been growing much faster than the industry. Uh, that's a problem. That usually means adverse selection, meaning you're getting adversely selected by the borrowers you don't want. Um, and then real quickly on 67, uh, the base effects here are going to get much steeper from a loan growth standpoint, meaning that their loan growth is going to come down more quickly. And that's going to create uh, significant um, uh, deterioration in their credit quality due to what's called the reverse denominator effect. Uh, and then finally, uh, very quickly, uh, the company is in the regulatory doghouse on slide 68. So they basically screwed two things up. One, they misclassified um, you know, a significant number of their cards, uh, which enabled them to overcharge from an interchange standpoint. And uh, they're also under an FDIC consent order. Uh, for those two reasons, they're not buying back any stock. Um, so we think the fundamental backdrop is worsening. 
Uh, they're in the regulatory doghouse. They're staring down the barrel of this potential late fee cram down of 75%. There's just a lot of, a lot of issues here. Well, that's, uh, there's a lot of data supporting Steiner's views. That's why he takes a little longer uh, and went a little over the time there. Uh, he's very data dependent, uh, you are. Uh, this is a, what's amazing to me is this stock and what just happened to it. One, it shows you that how, um, how much wherewithal Wall Street has with understanding the cycle, in particular the credit cycle and what you said, which is somebody who built a credit card company uh, and understands rates of change. Because it only had 2% short interest uh, going into like a very obvious Again, consumer slowing event and credit risk, which has been our call. So again, when people say, can you show me what, you see, what you're seeing? I mean, obviously we're not just staring at NVIDIA every day. I mean, this is, this is, this is a big company, 27 billion now and falling. Trend is 113, risk range is 97.09 to 112.95. On this recent bounce, I'd short more. Um, that's that, you know, got a lot of all the big players, Fido, Cap World, Vanguard, all hold it and now they have to reduce. So uh, without a buyback, that's a big problem. Good, um, good pitch on that uh, and a great call. Uh, it's not a new one as of today, but reiterating shorts on bounces to lower highs is a critical and professional way to execute. And again, we're not being bad people, we're being responsible people. So again, uh, Wall Street's in the business of selling you stock. Don't forget about that ever. And we're in the business of helping you risk manage that reality, all right? Daniel, one of the favorite, uh, fa people, people really like you. I think, I think it's because you're so nice. <laughs> You're a lot nicer than me. Well, let's see how this one goes. Let's see, if, let's see if they still think I'm nice. Is it the but, first long? Oh, uh, it's a long. It's long. Okay, we one for five on on, on pitches that are actually longs. So <laughs> go for it. Okay, and, and Keith, you know, you always coach us to put politics aside. So I'm, you know, I'm going to say that the audience needs to do that for this one too. So my long idea is tap Molson Coors. Okay. And sometimes change does happen overnight. <laughs> So this sounds like something Sun Tzu would say, never interrupt your opponent when he's making a mistake, and that's exactly what's happening here. Sometimes it's a macro environment, sometimes it's a stronger consumer, sometimes it's a company's own initiatives that are driving you know, top line and margins, inflections. In this case, Molson Coors, largest competitor, Bud Anheuser-Busch, has bungled its marketing and is seeding decades worth of market share gains overnight. The risk of Bud Light discounting impacting Molson Coors looks to be dissipated with Bud Light you know, clearing its excess inventory while Molson Coors continues to gain and not having to discount to match. Bud Light is only 5% of AB InBev's global volumes, but Miller Light and Coors Light US volumes are more than a third of their total, so it gives it a lot more exposure to this change that happened. So what are we talking about here? Additional volumes has high incremental margins, and that's, that's really the, the earnings kicker here for Molson Coors. In retailer surveys, Molson Coors leads in out of stocks currently, and that leaves further upside on the table. So that's a, a positive uh, from a stock perspective, right? That there's more upside in the, in the future. And then the modest valuation leaves upside for investors. The company has been actively reducing its leverage the last couple of years. Price increases have lagged in beer compared to other sectors of food and beverage and are driving the margin recovery. And our estimates are well above consensus expectations, reflecting a longer duration of competitive gains and margin flow through. I see upside of at least 25% to the shares. So just getting into it on slide 73. So 70% of the company's sales are denominated in US dollars. So Molson Coors is more levered to a change in the US market. On the next slide, you can see that more, more than 80% of the sales are in North America. Slide 75 is uh, margins are improving. We have price increases outpacing cost increases and that's a great time to own consumer staples companies. The PPI for breweries is at the lowest growth rate since February 2022, while price increases are at sort of near the highest right now. So this, this, the change that happened overnight here is, the, is when the controversy started with the first week of April when Bud Light gave Dylan Mulvaney a personalized pack of beer. Dylan Mulvaney posted a video highlighting the beer in a TikTok video that went viral. Uh, so then on slide 77, what, what happened here is and I think the customers are just reacting in an expected way. I think the customers are never wrong. So here we have Bud Light's VP of Marketing. Um, she said that weeks before the, the ad that she intended to evolve and elevate Bud Light. So it wasn't accidental what happened. It wasn't just a, a fluke uh, video. This was an on-purpose shift that the company, I think, really didn't plan its way around very well. So the, their head of marketing described the brand as its previous marketing as fratty and out of touch. And Bud Light's ad, you know, of course, was poorly executed, 
you know, you, you just don't do these strategic changes on the fly, and I think that you know speaks poorly of, of Bud's management team here. On slide 78, why this is also more important is that men drink three times as uh, more, three times as many men drink beer than, than women, and of course we know they also drink more in quantity. So, so they they're really went after the wrong uh, demographic, you know, sort of, and I, I argue, firing their core customer. On slide 79, Bud Light's off-premise volumes here, you can see that the volume declines suggest a permanent impairment. We really haven't seen them bounce off the bottom. And in turn, Bud, uh, Coors Light and Miller Light have been the key beneficiaries. So their, their volumes are up 20 to 25% since. Keith, I know you're a, a wine drinker, so I think you, you understand this. I, mean, if you, I think you remember the movie Sideways. Oh, yeah. So my question here is, did Bud Light have its sideways moment? So there's one line in that movie where, where Paul Giamatti, you know, he said, if anyone drinks Merlot, I'm leaving. I am not drinking any blank in Merlot, right? <laughs> that one line in the movie, this, think of it, compare it to the Bud Light, has hurt Merlot sales ever since. Merlot sales have never recovered. And, and Pinot, you know, of course, they talk glowingly about Pinot in the movie, and they've been on a, on a tear since. And you know, people dismiss, but this is just one line in a movie that wasn't even planned and could have this permanent shift in, in wine. And so when people say, you know, it's, Bud Light's going to recover next year, I think they could have had their sideways moment here. Mm. On slide 81, this is the financial volumes we're talking about for uh, Bud Light. My, my point on the volumes is Molson Coors has sort of you know, restructured the business in recent years, planning for unit declines. And you can see what they've had and what they've experienced. But when you get growth, you get these, the flow through, you know, this unexpected flow through, you have very high incremental margins when you've been planning your business on the opposite, because this is a manufacturing business. On slide 82, um, you know, you, you can see the company is going to be driving a lot of cash flow, and this is going to be sort of changing the company permanently. What are they going to do with the cash flow? They can reinvest it. They can do a bunch of other things. But that's a significant deleverage of the company that's going to be permanent here. And then on slide 83, you can see that the uh, institutional support has, has really not been behind Molson Coors, right? It's really not owned or, or liked by, by the sell side, and I, I think they're going to be catching up here as that change in uh, trend. And then on slide 84, you can see versus the peer group, Molson Coors is very attractively valued. It's, uh, you know, it, there's a lot more upside as people sort of project forward. You know, they, they all are treating this like a one-time event. And I think it's going to be a much longer than a one-time event. And you can see there's a lot more upside on the valuation if, if people start valuing it like its peers. Hmm. This is uh, what we call GARPY, right? They get a growth kicker, and it's at a GARP growth at a reasonable price. Right? Yes. And uh, the beer's at a reasonable price. Yes. And that's, uh, I like beer, as you know, and so does Dodge and Cox, evidently. They have a 10% position. Yeah. So I think that's another big issue here is if, and by the way, it's short butt against tap is your, your setup. So that's the other way to be uh, positioned if you do long short. But, um, but you know, th there are a lot of people, we talk to a lot of clients that are looking for, you know, visibility and cash flow heading into recession, uh, good balance sheet, again, dividend yield. This one's got like almost a two and a half percent yield. Is that a, an opportunity for them? Because they're going to get a windfall here, right? right? Every loss that they get from somebody who's just going to drink Coors Light instead is going to put the cash flow in their pocket. Is, right. is that is there an opportunity to do a special dividend or anything like that? That that's, would seem more likely, right? Because yeah. I, I don't know that management really knows what to plan on how yeah. permanent this change will be. So I think the special dividend would make the most sense. I think first we're going to see the deleveraging, right? So we'll give them some opportunities. They, they may make an acquisition or something small in that case, but nothing that's really going to move the needle, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a special dividend would make the most sense, <laughs> and it would sort of capitalize on, on what's happening here. Yeah, this just in terms of levels. I mean, this thing is clearly bullish trade, bullish trend, trend support is 62.79, risk range is 67.35 to 71.90, so still upside. It's very typical of a stock like this, and I do it myself, you pull it back to the pandemic highs, and you're like, well, that's well past that, right. how could it be that good? Right. And of course, every intellectual person, uh, even though they don't have any problem doing this with NVIDIA or any Magma stock, because they'll just buy it higher every day, they're like, oh, I missed it, I can't buy it. Right. Because so. the, the change is so momentous, and people are just like discounting how long it will last. Yeah. And that's, that's the, the kicker here. It's, isn't it amazing the behavior of that? Yeah. Like, it's absolute FOMO that drives NVIDIA higher every single day. You're right. pretty close to it. But you, you can't buy TAP because you missed it. Yeah. So there's no FOMO there. Right. I got it. Good. All right. Uh, you're just the idiosyncrasies of Wall Street. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. All right. Uh, that's our first long. I have a sneaking suspicion, Rob Simone. <coughs> 
uh, is not <laughs> gonna give me a real estate long, but I, I'm not, I, I actually, for those of you that don't know, I don't know what they're gonna pitch. I know what all their ideas are, by the way, if you want detail uh, on all these leading up to it, there's a, work, there's a workflow to it. We, we have the call every day, it's called the call. You can listen in on, on our morning meeting. You know, about halfway through the meeting, I go to Simone and I'm like, what's going on with MPW today? Uh, or, and or he'll tell me what's going on with something else. So you know, this is all part of the process. Uh, everybody who's paying for Hedgeye Nation and our products, and in particular Sector Pro products, should our, shouldn't be entirely surprised by what ticker uh, is being pitched. Uh, but, you know, of all the things they, they can pick, Rob, I actually have no idea what you're going to tell me right now. So give me a pitch. All right. So it's, it's DLR. It's, uh, well, you're right, first of all. I mean, I can't really get up here and, and pitch along given that we're short the fur. Um, that would just be kind of <laughs> stupid. So I'm not going to do that. But, um, there, there so you're going to take the long, uh, but... other side of AI through real estate. I thought, I thought, digital, well, I'm gonna I, take... I thought DLR was uh, an AI company. Well, I just got back from San Francisco. I'm not only going to take the other side of, a, uh, of AI, I'm going to take the other side of like most of the buy side that resides in, in San Francisco because I, I shit you not, I was in a meeting um, <laughs> where I literally, I'm, I'm, rattling, I'm rattling off numbers like facts and, and I was literally sad. Like, again, it's fine, like difference of opinion is cool, but like in no uncertain terms, I was told the numbers don't matter. and. Awesome. Like, let's let's pitch it as a short. So I'm going to roll in here. I'm going to talk about DLR. Uh, so DLR, I came over to the dark side on um, on this one. I was actually like very skeptical of the bear thesis last year, but but basically DLR is one of two remaining uh, <clears throat> uh, data center reads, and it, it's a very controversial name on a couple different fronts. But um, so like my first slide, I guess it's slide 86 in the packet here. Just a, a basic description of the bull and bear catalyst, but also the company itself. And I, you know, this, this may very well be one of the most misunderstood REITs out there. Um, and it definitely falls into um, the Tina trade or there is no alternative. So when you talk to the long only REIT guys, there's incredible debate and confusion about like what you can actually own. And so Resi would be there, DLR would be there, and it's purely based on narrative. It, it cannot be based on, on numbers because the numbers are absolute shit. So if you go to the, the next, uh, next slide, slide 87, and by the way, the, the numbers being shit is not DLR's fault. It's just what, what the business is, right? And so I guess it's like to your point earlier, if, if, if the idea or the goal um, from your, your, your conversation with Daniel before was to find you know, companies with good balance sheets, good cash flow, uh, relatively large market cap, um, low beta, like it, it really only has one of those in that size. Um, so, guys, next slide. Uh, th this is, I'm going to start with the catalyst. So, like, we, we like to say at Hedgeye, you know, valuation is only a data point. It's not a catalyst. And in my view, probably the biggest catalyst, catalyst here is I see downside to earnings. Maybe not this quarter, although I am coming underneath where the street is. I'm at, like, a buck 62, 162 in FFO. Um, the street's at, like, 165 if you go by fact set numbers, at least on last check. But I think there's like probably 2% downside to numbers this year, or maybe 5% downside next year. And it's because um, there's this like hamster wheel effect, right? So this company, and this is the part that like took me a while to get comfortable with and get, you know, go to the quote unquote dark side. Uh, I've, I've come to believe that there's an incredibly high depletion rate for data center real estate. And it, it basically forces this company to perpetually develop. Um, a develop or redevelop. And what that requires is capital, like a constant access and need to raise capital. Um, kind of like, kind of like what Dan Skyver likes to say, not necessarily being in the business of, of, um, of selling stock, but like needing to sell stock. So the company already raised, uh, tapped its ATM for 1.1 billion. Um, it's probably going to sell about a billion and a half to two billion dollars of assets and, uh, JV interest at like call it a, you know, a blended seven to eight percent cap rate. Well, the stock's trading at a five and a half right now, and these numbers have obviously moved since I did this did this deck. But if you think about what that means, it's incredibly diluted. So if you're if you're selling um, if you're selling stock and you're selling assets and you're refinancing somewhere between seven hundred million dollars and a billion dollars of debt a year at you know a negative three to four hundred basis point spread on your cost of debt it's really 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 hard to grow earnings and so i think numbers are too high they need to come down 
Uh, next slide, you can kind of see a, a manifestation of this. And this is something that like, you know, or w one of the one of the contributors to this, this, you know, kind of phenomenon. And you could see this across like much of my space. The weighted average cost of debt is three percent. Right. And it's come down secularly oh, since 2011, obviously, with the, the lowering of interest rates and their their like ability to borrow overseas. Um, obviously, that's spiking higher. That's going to be an earnings drag as they reprice that debt. Next slide, um, the the revision trend uh, is decidedly negative. Uh, they've missed, by the way, the, the earnings surprise index is pretty poor for them too. Like how often do you see a REIT only meet or, you know, miss estimates in half of the last, you know, call it six quarters. That That's pretty atrocious. Um, just given how like, you know, it easy it is for, for these guys, all REITs to kind of manipulate gap earnings or, or sorry, straight line, FFO numbers in order to like manufacture a beat. These guys have not only missed, but the revision cycle is decidedly negative and, and declining further. And I think they're going to miss again this year. Next slide, maybe now getting into more of the fundamentals. Um, this is something that like, again, like it's kind of a quality screen. Um, if you normalize for all of the factors that are outside of management's control, and, and again, it's not their fault. It may just be that it's a shitty business. This company has created no value um, if you just apply like a, it's, it's a lost art, right? Like apply a constant multiple um, to the earning stream and then like, you know, subtract from that the capital that's used to finance that earning stream. It's a straight line. I could give you uh, two or three dozen names where this is gradually upsloping as it should be that have better balance sheets, better economics, better growth profiles, et cetera, that are appropriate for longs. This one is not. Next slide. Um, now, this gets into the reason why they have to be like a, a serial capital issuer. Um, and I'm going to be cognizant of time here. Their CapEx burden is going up. Um, I think this is underreported. Next slide. So this is the fun. This is the one that brought me over to the dark side. So my view is they're materially underreporting recurring CapEx. So if you're a serial developer, if you develop every year, GAP allows you to capitalize interest and overhead. That's at a $200 million run rate. That is roughly $40 million above what they report as the recurring CapEx that goes to AFFO, a metric that they're asking you to value the stock on. I view that as not fair um, and completely like inappropriate, especially like in a, in a bear market. Last slide, uh, maybe one more because I'm running out of, out of time. This is manifesting itself similar, similar to M MPW, but for different reasons in a secularly, secular increase in leverage over time. Um, all indicators of what I think to be is a bad business. Last slide. I think that this, you shouldn't be willing to pay, next one, you shouldn't be willing to pay more than $50 a share for this thing. I know that sounds crazy at 120, but that's the, that's the story. Anyway, that's all for me. This is, um, this is a very interesting setup, particularly into event risk. They have to report reality. That's the thing about companies, right? You can, uh, you could not yeah. understand what's going on out there in the market today, which it's every day isn't about fundamentals. There's a lot of flow. There's a lot of short-term options trading. There's a lot of index lift. There's a lot of things that people uh, flips on gamma squeezes, et cetera, et cetera, things that we can teach you here. Um, but the, the, the goal is to understand it, that as that part of the game has changed, that there are fundamentals that come home to roost and quickly, i.e. Uh, what happened with DFS or Discover Financial. So this one, Rob, it's like knocking on the door. It's been knocking on the door for a while, but the door is still shut. Yep. So the door being trend resistance is 121. This stock has come from well higher. It got pounded uh, for fundamental reasons. It is, you know, again, it's a real estate stock. And, and then all of a sudden it levitated on mm -hmm. AI narratives. So that's why the bulls want to say, uh, the numbers don't matter, you know. I, I, and I yep. said, as I said this morning on the call, I, you know, I've been doing this for 24 years. I've seen so many, so many people on Wall Street come and go, and they say stupid shit like that. The ones that have gone, you know. And and it's 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 okay. You can yep. be really clever and write on your stock for two to three quarters, but you're not going to be around for a long time saying stupid shit like that. That's just stupid. Okay. We don't want stupid. Uh, if you want to go to the stupid network, go watch CNBC. Um, but the risk range here is interesting because. Yeah, it's 114 to 123, right? So if people are willing to believe or the shorts aren't getting paid right away on the event, the top end of the range is 123, right? So that would take you through the door. Trend would be just above mm -hmm. it. Um, and then on the other side of it, you got you know the black hole, which is down closer to 112 at the low end of the range. So um, that's the, the, it's a very interesting setup. 6% short interest. So some people yeah. believe you on the short side because you got to pay the... You know, you got to, you, you, it's, it's tougher to short REITs because you got to pay, you got the dividend to deal with, right? 
Yeah, definitely. No, it, it, it's very true. I mean, right now, uh, what the stock's yielding, just doing a quick check, uh, for just under 4%, and then you have the borrow on top of it. So, yeah, I mean, it's an expensive proposition. Um, but, you know, like a lot of people are r- rolling their put, put positions or kind of like turning out their short position. Look, like when, when we get, if and when we get another credit event or a capital markets event, like this is squarely in the bucket in my space that's going to puke. It just is, right? Like it's, it's lower end of the quality spectrum. And like, I'm not going to stand here and recommend stuff like that as a long, um, given the firm's macro view and just the fundamental outlook on the company. Um, so that's, that's it. No, and we appreciate that. And uh, if you want to get more of Rob's um, quality, uh, again, quality of cash flow, safety of balance sheet list, he does that in his Sector Pro product. Uh, I think it's one of the better things that he's produced lately in terms of funnels or screens. Uh, and again, you can believe whatever you need to believe. Some people have to believe because that's how they get paid. Some people want to believe because they just believe. And some people just wouldn't know otherwise, so they believe. Um, we believe that the economy continues to slow because the economic data continues to slow. We believe that the Fed is going to keep the cost of capital high, therefore a sector inside of the fur that's financials, industrials, real estate, and of course U.S. retailers, are going to continue to feel the pressure. We've walked through that in many different lenses here, from credit cards and risks there to a realty stock right here that's being pitched as an AI phenomenon. Uh, So there's a lot to do, right? And we're going to be here for a long, long time. We've been here for 15 years. Our process is better than anybody else's. Uh, And that's the point. We want to get you as close as you can to understanding how to be on the pitch if you were to be able to do it yourself, how to pick the right sectors, how to pick the right stocks on the both long and short side and risk manage it all the way through. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.